there. But leadership is something that can be taught. It's taught experientially in rooms like this, where we are now a group dynamic. This is a group dynamic. And in this dynamic, with real life presentation of cases of leadership failures, leadership challenges, you can tease out some basic principles that they have developed as a, as a theory of leadership, that formal authority and leadership are different. Leadership is not some trait of some, you know, upfront guy taking the whole community down the proverbial football field until you have a touchdown. L authority is a tool of leadership. It's distinct from leadership. Leadership is an activity that can be exercised by anyone from the middle of a bureaucracy. Often people with authority figures, who are authority figures like the mayor, do exercise leadership. But often the leadership is exercised without formal authority. Leadership is mobilizing groups to face problems. Groups hate problems. They want to flee from them. They either just marginalize the person who's bringing up the problem, or they assassinate the person who brings up the problem. So leadership requires an educative strategy. Leadership, you need to constantly intervene in that dynamic to uh, focus attention on problematic realities. You need to identify the adaptive challenge you're facing. Not, you know, green buildings and integrated design, changing people's entire understanding of the value of the building, changing people's understanding of what you invest in with capital dollars and when you get that return on investment, changing people's understanding of that. That's not just some technical fix. You just can't tell people to design buildings differently. That's a very slow process of really examining your values and really having people face the facts that they need to appreciate, as John outlined so eloquently, that buildings are consuming our resources in ways that are just unacceptable. We really need to change. We all need to undergo an adaptive change to appreciate that we need to value buildings differently. So I can obviously go on about this model, but let me just apply it to the thematic series of governmental events. So, our Earth Day Green Building charrette was an environmental intervention, leadership without authority. Our charrette report, where we blanketly stole the building that teaches moniker from Oberlin. We now have parks that teach. We have airport terminals that teach. We just stole that notion from Oberlin College. And I couldn't be more thrilled because it really is the most powerful way to get people engaged in understanding that developing a capital asset like a building is an incredible opportunity, not only to build something that you learn in, but to build something that you learn from. It's a very powerful, engaging metaphor. So our groundbreaking and dedication that was strengthening the needed holding environment. You need to have something that holds people together while you're undergoing this really dis uncomfortable disequilibrium of change. Change is uncomfortable. People resist it. They push back against it. They either shut you up or kill you. Um, so we dedicated the building. We had an economics of high performance green building policy panel, obviously, at the green building, at the building that teaches. But it was co-hosted by the Greater Boston Real Estate Board, the very conservative 7,500 member network representing the most conservative attitudes towards real estate development. In many ways, it was bringing the most uh, you know, competing faction right into the mix of what we were trying to hold together. And um, uh, the leadership model calls that intervening cross-factionally. Bring the faction that's really pushing against the economic message with the concerns of the, um, uh, econo I mean, the environmental message with the concerns of the economic development implications of building green. And then the, at that event, the mayor, we were able to get external funding, which was, I would say, the most entrepreneurial aspect of the kind of work I do. I, can't cost the mayor any money in this. We pay for policemen and sanding ball fields. We don't pay for policy development. So I got significant grants from local foundations. Based on the success of the real building, I said, look, we have this, this building that teaches, and it's going to teach the entire community what to do, and here's how we're going to do it. We're going to have a stakeholder task force made up of high-level representatives of each uh, representative faction around that 
circle of work. You have the environmentalists, you have the economic development people in the guise of bankers who make the loans, real estate investment trusts. We had unions, the people that build the buildings, the program managers. Obviously, we had the designers and the engineers. We had all the people involved in the dynamic of a uh, building construction project learn from this real project. We had built a real green building. We had the pain of integrated design, the timing of ordering the materials that made it green. We had the experience of engineers and architects talking to each other early so that we built a geothermal heat pump and didn't build a backup furnace. That's a real integrated design uh, moment that informed the agenda of this year-long citywide task force. And at the end of that task force in November of 2004, one week after the Red Sox won the World Series for the first time in 87 years, right in front of the green monster in Boston, we announced green building standards. We were turning Beantown into Greentown, and most of my job is advertising. It's coming up with slogans and, and uh, brands like our Boston Green Brick, which we unfolded at the Green Monster, it, blah, blah, blah. And so here we are, you know, attaching green building to the green monster to the most winning moment in the history of Boston, and the mayor announced a three-year implementation plan. Change is painful. You need to allow adaptive challenges to ripen. You, once you have an educative strategy that's beginning to work, you need to respect the pain of change. You need to allow people to learn on their own. What's the right thing to do here? You need to really respect that you know, you're asking them to really change the entire way their loyalty-based teams in the past where they dealt out the HVAC contract to their mother's cousin and the uh, brick contract to their best friend. That's, and they built buildings. They got things done. Here we're asking them to step back and do all this kind of new process, integrated design, transparency, all this kind of stuff. So it was a three-year implementation plan. We allowed issues to ripen. And um, as I said, uh, within three years, we were able to get citywide private development green building zoning. This grew into a climate action plan. I'll just show you that we have one. I just got a solar program. It's really exciting. And now the mayor put our green collar job workforce development program front and center in his latest Chamber of Commerce speech. So I'll leave you with this message. Instead of a case study, our green building was a case study. A case study is traditionally something you learn in law school, business school, government school. It is usually a retrospective decision-making situation that you bring alive in a classroom so that students can learn and think through the dynamics that I've just been talking about and learn from something that happened in the past. I submit that if you have a project, if you have the resources for any kind of project, project-based policy development, using these ideas of leadership, intervening with your project iteratively over and over and over again, you can prospectively, literally, build the case for change. Thanks. <laughs>